All right. So again, welcome everybody. This is an introduction to First Lego League. And um, this is particularly aimed at, um, nope, sorry, okay. I've got the tech, I think. Um, this is particularly aimed at first time coaches or folks who are coming into a coaching role for the first time. Um, it says August 4th because this, this, slot, this uh, training has been offered several times approaching the beginning of the season. And um, we are constantly and um, keeping, it, keeping the information as current as we can to help um, please run as smoothly as possible in this, our 2022-2023 season. Um, so part of coming into FIRST and ORTOP is um, beginning to understand the many, many acronyms that we all use, um, and also to understand the difference between FIRST, which is an, a national and international organization, and ORTOP, which is the Oregon um, delivery partner for FIRST. So um, FIRST is this program that is headquartered out on the East Coast. They run international robotics competitions, and their vision is very broad, which makes sense given, given the scope of their organization, to transform our culture by creating a world where science and technology are celebrated and where young people dream of becoming science and technology leaders. ORTOP is Oregon's homegrown organization. We started about 23, 22 years ago um, as a small nonprofit to run the um, robotics competitions in Oregon. And our mission is very much Oregon centric. We are here for Oregon students. We are interested in um, increasing awareness and access to STEM programs for Oregon students, particularly those that have been traditionally underrepresented in STEM fields. Um, and, and we're really community oriented. So while we are a robotics organization, we, we, really, um, we really believe that robotics is the tool that we're using to serve our community and, our, and the people that we are working with. So our vision, ORTOP's vision, is every Oregon student belongs and contributes to a community that celebrates STEM thinkers and makers. And more than that, we want every Oregon student to think of themselves as a STEM thinker and as a maker. So um, FIRST and ORTOP are both acronyms. FIRST stands for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And the website that you see in front of you is um, the portal for all things FIRST. And as um, a coach for a team, you will have a dashboard. You'll have to make an account on the FIRST Inspires website. You'll have a dashboard. You'll manage the way that your team interacts with the national um, organization from that website. ORTOP, Oregon Robotics Tournament and Outreach Program has our own website. Um, and that's where you'll find things like the calendar, announcements for workshops like this one. Um, you'll be able to register your teams for local events through the ORTOP calendar. Um, and we are the program delivery partner for FIRST. So um, we are bringing what FIRST does to Oregon. Um, also, these slides will be available to you as well as the recording, but the slides will be available to you as a PDF um, after tonight. So um, they'll, it'll, they'll get emailed out and there's a QR code at the end of the presentation. So please don't, um, don't feel like you need to be frantically writing down URLs. Um, so when FIRST says, when you build robots, you build community. We actually had an alumni say to us, you know, in ORTOP, in order to build robots, first we have to build community. And um, we really felt like that, that was exactly how we want our alumni to feel. And it's exactly how we think of the work that we do, right? Is that we're here to build community. And in order to, to have the robots do their thing, we first have to build that community. And so bringing that into your work with students, into your work with your teams, um, 
it's really, I mean, running a team is running a community. And so much of the work that you do would fall under the umbrella of social emotional learning. It's soft skills like conflict resolution and communication. Um, and the robot, well, tons of fun, um, is actually going to take up a very small amount of your time. So the underlying pedagogy for um, for first Lego League and in fact for all of first robotics is project based learning. Um, so for those of you who are in education, this is probably really familiar for those of you who are education adjacent. Um, I'm the PBL or project based learning is something that's hit the news periodically. Uh, the idea with project based learning is that the doing is key to the understanding. So it is a process oriented um, approach to learning. And it's also really focused on student voice, student choice and authenticity. Um, so one of the things that you'll hear a lot is the, the people doing the talking are the people doing the learning, which is why this particular workshop is in um, stands in absolute opposition to all of the pedagogy that we're teaching tonight, because I'll be talking and and if we were coming from a project based learning place, the person doing the talking is the person doing the learning and that would be bad. So um, in your work with kids and in your work with your teams, the idea is you are there to guide them through the process and they are there to do the learning. So they're the ones asking the questions. They're the ones directing their research. They're the ones trying and failing and trying again. And you are there to guide them, but not to give them answers. So another, another place to kind of focus your, um, your thoughts as you're planning the process is in an engineering design process where students and engineers are going to take a problem, make a plan, model it, test it, reflect on the, the data that they get out of those tests, and then there's reiteration, right? So from that reflection, then they're going to redesign, model, test, reflect, redesign, model, test. And you can see that there's some similarities between the engineering design process and a project-based learning process because there's, there's a lot of reflection, revision, and then uh, reiteration built into both of these. Um, and again, the process is key. This isn't about the end product. Um, even though everybody is coming to um, play with a robot in a tournament season, the process is what is most important for both your, your kids to have the full experience of what FIRST has to offer um, and also to get to a place where they can stand in front of a, a panel of judges and have the conversation that um, those judges are looking to hear. So, um, PBL is the process of learning through design, development, and completion of projects. And then these projects are highlighting the process of learning itself. Authentic, inquiry-based, hands-on, um, really doing and learning by doing, which again means that the learners, your students, your team, need to be the ones who are actually hands-on. Um, and they need to be the ones finding the information, trying it out, and seeing if it fits. So we ask that our students should be invited to learn, right? We're not asking them to um, tell us what they already know. We're asking them to, to really invest in that process of making, sharing, reflecting, communicating, and reiterating. Um, and all of this comes out in first core values and core values is actually something that um, students will be that's a it's a category that students will end up being judged in during a tournament. Um, so these core values are are things that we hope are showing up at every practice. Um, and we hope that at, you know, at the end of a season students really have um, have a lived experience of these values. So discovery, innovation, impact, inclusion is really important. Teamwork is really important. And of course, fun. 
Um, and these values are, are some of the things that makes, make first stand out from our competition. Um, there are other robotics programs out there and they don't bring the pedagogy that first brings. So while it's possible to build a program from those, you know, from those other robotics programs, it would be, um, it would be building something that first has already been doing for decades and doing really well. Um, and one of the, the things that, that we really, really want to um, emphasize is that in order for students to have that full first experience, coaches and mentors are guides. We are not the experts, right? So we're here to facilitate conversations between students. We are here to, you know, help them on the path of learning, point them towards resources without being the resource ourselves. Um, we are asking questions that prompt them to do the thinking. This is not the Socratic method, right? We are not asking questions we already know the answer to and waiting for them to tell us what we want to hear. We are asking them things that will help them think. And then again, so important, we're providing resources, not answers, right? So we are not the wisest person in the room. If you have never done robotics before, you are perfectly positioned to do this because we, coaches and mentors are, um, are, are people that are helping students understand their own learning process, not necessarily content experts. So, you know, come into every team session thinking you are supporting, you're empathizing, right? Because that, that learning process can be uncomfortable to, to get to a place where you, you don't quite know. It can be hard and you're there with empathy and support and inspiration for your students as they do this very challenging thing. Um, so the diagram here comes from um, Vygotsky, who uh, was an education thinker from um, at this point almost two centuries ago, but it, it was last century. And he talks about the zone of proximal development, that when you're looking at what students of any age, um, how they learn, you have a small amount of what you can do independently, right? And then you have outside of that, a, a place of, you know, I can do this next thing, but I need some support. I need some scaffolding. Um, I need some direction. And then outside of that is actually, that's actually what you can't do yet. And in order for students to learn, they have to be past the things that they already know, right? Because if you're doing what you already know how to do independently, you might be practicing, but you're not necessarily learning new things. But if you ask a student to do something that they fully cannot do yet, that they do not have the skill set to do, even with help, what you're going to find is frustration and um, frustration will eventually turn into an unwillingness to participate. So, so that stretch goal, that thing that where you, where you aim students at reaching further than they're comfortable with, but not so far that they can't find success. That is called the zone of proximal development. And that is where we want students to live to have um, the most growth in this program. Um, another way to think about how you speak to students and the kinds of questions that you ask your team um, is to think about the language that you use. Um, some of you might be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. A more modern take on this is Webb's Depth of Knowledge or DOK and, and prompting students to, um, to think more deeply by changing your language. So instead of asking them to, um, you know, kind of the basics of who, what, of who, what, when, why, where, how, right? Those are, those are kind of basic skill um, applications. We want to ask them to think more deeply by asking about cause and effect. We want to ask about what's, you know, what's the relationship of this new thing that you learned to something that you already knew, know or knew before. What's the influence it might have on the world or, or on a situation. Um, 
kind of asking them to take that leap into synthesizing what they already know, analyzing information that's coming in and um, making suppositions and, and hypotheses and then testing them because this is a, this is a situation where they get to test their robots. Um, and there is um, another workshop on Thursday um, specifically about the innovation project where we will talk um, more in depth about the kind of pedagogy and language use that you can use to really um, get students thinking. So throughout this all, right, the whole point is to emphasize the student voice, not yours, right? You are not going to do what I'm doing, which is talking at you. So we're asking students to ask questions, build knowledge, make connections. We're asking them to collaborate with each other, right? So you as the coach are not the main person that they're talking to or that they're working with. They are working with each other. That's, that's part of the community building that they're doing. We're asking them to determine solutions through trial and error. Um, and then we're asking them to talk about it, to communicate their thinking and communicate their process. And all of that is happening during a season. Um, and the season for FLL um, started with kickoff, which was last month. Um, we're coming into competition season, which will start um, later on in the fall and then our final championships will happen in the winter um, and when you come to a tournament um, regardless of the level the the four um, areas that a team will be judged on are core values the innovation project robot design and robot play. And so we're gonna, we're gonna go through each of these tonight. Although again, the innovation project has its own workshop coming up on Thursday. That's also a Zoom workshop. Um, and before I get more into these four elements, um, I'm gonna pause for questions or thoughts. Okay. So you just one question you mentioned first is a separate organization on the East Coast, right? Yes. So first is a much larger organization that has um, that has a presence in all 50 states in the United States, as well as um, many other countries. OK, so the first Lego League is a league that is being run by first. Right. So the so what happens is program delivery partners in each area. So in Oregon, it's ORTOP run tournaments that kind of, um, you know, it, it almost works like a bracket system where we we narrow the field and then we send on a certain number of teams into a world competition where um, teams from every area, both in the United States and outside of the United States come to compete together. Got it. Um, but uh, our top and for first are not related as uh, organizations. They're two different uh, organizations. Yes, so we we have agreements with first about you know when we can use their brand and when we can use their logo. Um, there's some you know there's some funding that goes back and forth, um, and we play by their rules when we're running their tournaments, of course, right? So they they set a lot of the rules, and we also um, part of our work in Oregon is to help shepherd teams through the first system because it's a little, it can be a little challenging the first time through. Um, so we're not part of FIRST, but we are a smaller organization with many agreements with the larger organization so that we can do the same work. Okay, and in uh, other uh, states also, are there organizations like on our top that work with first for that uh, state? Yeah, so some some states have their own per state, and then there are some that are regional. So, um, for instance, the I think it's New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and um, maybe 
one other state are like the Atlantic, the Mid-Atlantic um, organization. So it's some states are are combined into a region, and some states are individual the way that that we are in Oregon. For um, for FRC, which is a, a program for high school students with really big robots, um, that organ that those tournaments are actually run through a region called the Pacific Northwest region, and ORTOP is part of that, but it's run out of um, First Washington, which is the ORTOP that's up in Washington. Sounds good. Thank you. And then some states like California, I think, actually has three separate organizations running north, south, and mid. So, um, yeah, so the way that FIRST gets their local tournaments run is through um, local organizations. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so um, one more thought is that um, growth mindset has come into um, sort of the popular um, awareness through the work of Carol Dweck and um, her book, I think actually hit the national bestseller list for um, uh, several months. And this is absolutely something that we push in in first and in our programs because it is not true that that students have an inherent and immutable skill with robotics right the harder they work at it the more they're going to learn the the better their skills or their skill set is going to be so we really want to emphasize for students that the more motivated they are and the more effort they put in, the higher their achievement will be. And that this is growth that it can happen within a season, but also really can happen over many seasons. So we'll have teams that, you know, come together in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and they'll compete for two or three or even, you know, four seasons together. And the growth that we see across seasons is, um, is really mind boggling. I mean, the, the depth of what students can do and how they're thinking is really um, a beautiful thing to see. So one of the things that's, that is lovely about FIRST is that we get results and they're measurable and they have been measured. Um, so FIRST has um, participated with Brandeis University for a longitudinal study. It's ongoing. This is the data that came out um, not that long ago, but it was pre-pandemic. Um, the data that we're seeing post-pandemic, interestingly, is not that different. Um, so we didn't lose ground for the students who have continued to participate in FIRST, even though it's been a rocky couple of years, we're still seeing so much impact from FIRST in student populations. So um, I want to emphasize particularly here that 33% um, of um, students who identify as female or gender non-conforming, that, um, that statistic con um, considers both, they actually come into a STEM major and into engineering. Um, we also see while students are still in school that they are more interested in their academic uh, performance and that they're more interested in academically challenging themselves. So given an option, they will take a more challenging math or science course. Um, and then after school, right, after our, our students graduate and we, we um, have gone and, and spoken to employers who have first alumni with them, what they speak about is an improved problem solving skill set, an increased ability to manage their time. Um, conflict resolution skills are recognizably um, developed, and communication skills have also been developed. And so this kind of result, I mean, this is also something that is unique to FIRST amongst our competitors, that you just don't see this kind of impact um, across uh, students from students who do robotics, but without the additional social emotional components that first brings to the table. Um, 
so paying attention to that pedagogy, really living those core values, um, those are the things that make FIRST the better program, um, I'm, I can say, and also that, that really sh show up when we look at impact. Um, and I'm looking forward to the new um, data becoming available because um, particularly in the context of the of the pandemic, I think it's so important to recognize when when programs can um, continue to be effective, even when circumstances are so drastically different. So um, in Oregon, what you do is um, you register your team and you have to register your team both with FIRST National, let them know that you have a team, and then with ORTOP for the specific tournaments and the season that you want to play in. So you're registering your team with nationals so that you get um, some of the some of the game boards, some of the equipment, some of the challenges. You're registering with ORTOP so you're actually able to compete and so you can take advantage of things like this workshop. Um, the first LEGO League challenge is the the challenge is new every year and that comes from First National. Um, events and tournaments are run by ORTOP um, until we get to the level of worlds. Teams and meetings are um, individually run by, by you all, right? By coaches, by schools. So ORTOP does not um, manage like when teams meet or where they meet. We have a, a registrar that keeps track of what teams there are in Oregon, but the, the individual schedules are set by coaches and administrators in schools. Um, and then equipment um, is specifically managed again by the teams. Um, ORTOP has some equipment that is available for teams to borrow for the season sometimes. Um, and we bring, we bring equipment to tournaments, um, but the kind of daily equipment that you'll be using with your team, that's something that you um, will be providing and also kind of doing the materials management around. Your team will need a budget. There is team support available through ORTOP. So if you are running a team, particularly through schools or an after-school program, um, and especially for um, those teams that are, are demographically made up of students that um, traditionally are not represented in STEM, in STEM fields or careers, there is money available that ORTOP has raised for supporting those teams to come to um, tournaments and competitions and to have the full experience of the program. And then the resource guide is, um, is a combination of resources from FIRST that, that you will get directly like the team meeting guide um, and then some, some help from ORTOP to kind of um, interpret some of the directions from FIRST and also to point you in the right places when things are a little unclear. So, so we act um, we act sometimes as middle people um, between first and teams and sometimes as guides for teams to navigate the first system and sometimes as um, our own individual entity because ORTOP also runs events outside of the first season so that teams are able to um, continue skill building throughout the year. So when you want to get in touch with somebody, if your question has to do with FIRST National and you know for sure that it's a FIRST question, you're going to sign into your dashboard, which is your, your account at firstinspires.org. Um, if you are asking this question on behalf of a team, you're either the coach or the administrator of that team. Um, and this is also where if you want to volunteer for an event, you will sign, you would sign into that dashboard and um, go through the steps to become a volunteer and indicate that you wanted to volunteer. Um, ORTOP has a kind of catch-all email address for teams that's registrar at ORTOP.org. And when you email that, you kind of 
you get um, filtered into an inbox that the entire staff has access to. So if you're if you have a question but you don't know who on staff has the answer, you're writing registrar at ortop.org, and then the whole staff can figure out and get you to the right person faster. Um, what we found is that if we you know if we said well you know we have an events manager and we have a communications person and we have a director of education and um, we have a director of programs and then teams were left trying to figure out who to ask their question to and that was not particularly efficient. Um, our goal as an organization is to be easy to work with and this seemed easier to just tell teams if you need to get in touch with us email us at registrar at ortop.org and then the right person will get back to you. When you register with FIRST, um, so this is through that firstinspires.org website, and the people who need to have accounts there are the team themselves. So that includes um, kind of the, when you sign up, you're signing up the team as its own separate entity. The coach is going to need, or actually the two coaches are going to need an account. Um, and that has to do with something that we called y, that we call YPP, youth protection. Um, and you, uh, the youth protection policy is something that you go through with first. Even if you all are a credentialed teacher already, you'll need to go through the first system so that they are sure that everybody that's working with their students is allowed to work with their students. Um, it is a relatively painless process um, and it is all online. And then, um, Team members also need to register with FIRST to be able to sign permissions and releases. So the parents and guardians need to sign. Um, it is easier to do it online, but if you have students or parents and, um, or guardians who are uncomfortable with doing it online or unable to do it online, you can email registrar at ortop.org and we will get you paper copies. Um, and then some teams and um, Jerome, I think this might, um, might apply to building blocks for sure, have um, a role called an administrator. So every team, every individual team has to have two coaches, but there are several community organizations um, or schools that are running more than one team because there are limits of the number of students who are on each team or they're at different locations, but there's one person who's kind of doing the bureaucratic piece. And so that is the administrator role. An administrator does not have to be a coach. An administrator can be a coach, um, but what we found is that it is a useful role to have if you have, you know, if you're a community organization and what you have are eight teams, um, having somebody sign up as the administrator and just run the dashboard for all eight teams frees up the coaches to actually coach. Um, and it's also true that occasionally ORTOF acts as the administrator for teams, particularly teams that are associated with um, schools or educational institutions. Um, and again, we'll, we usually do that for the first or second season um, that a, a partner is, is kind of setting up their ecosystem. Um, and then we'll hand it off to somebody who is more local to that partner organization. Um, when you register with FIRST, the, the reason that you are registering with FIRST is to get access to season resources. So this season's challenge set to the documentation that goes along with it. Um, you get uh, communications from FIRST headquarters, which um, I've been told can sometimes be overwhelming, but do contain some, some pretty important information. Um, and in order to participate with or top in order to, um, to have your teams be eligible for the competitions, you have to be registered with FIRST too. If you want to run teams without competing, you don't need to register for FIRST. But if your team has any interest in competing, you do need to register with FIRST. Um, and you can't get this season's challenge set without registering with FIRST. Um, so before I go even more into that, are there questions? And I think I saw Brad, welcome. 
Um, we are kind of in the middle of things here, um, but I'll wait for a minute if you have any questions. One, no. One's like yeah. the deadline for applying for this, uh, like December's tournament. Um, so I, I, I believe it's in October. Oh, okay. I believe the deadline is in October. Um, and if you miss it by a little bit, there's usually a, a way to work around it. Um, the thing that happens is that if you don't get in by the absolute deadline, your team starts to not have enough time. Mm -hmm. If they haven't received this season's challenge, it can be really hard for them to, to be able to put in the amount of time that they need to, um, to kind of achieve results. Oh, you just um, register to get all the supplies sent to you on like mission? models and stuff yeah like so, you, oh, okay. so in order in order to get this season's um challenge you have to register with first gotcha. um yeah we can't get you this season's challenge without that so oh, yeah. yeah but i i believe the deadline is in october oh good so thank you yeah so um See, I'm seeing some chat come up. Um, October 15th. Thanks, Bobby. Um, Brad, welcome. And we're happy to have you. And um, we're just going to keep going. So when you register for your team for a season, you can then you'll then receive invitations to participate in local events. So um, at ORTOP, we separate it into kind of first events and ORTOP events. The first events are all of the ones that have um, slots that would lead to advancement, right? So you start with a local tournament and then you go to state and then coming out of state, there are spots available to go to worlds. Um, so all of that is um, what's called here for sanctioned or their first events. Additionally, ORTOP runs events that are um, that are are about first robotics, but don't actually have a relationship to that advancement bracket, right? So, um, in the course of a season, you know, we have. We have events in the fall. Um, most of those are for older teams, things like Girls Gen or First Fair, but we love it when FLL will come, when FLL will send um, team members to see what's coming up next. And Girls Gen in particular is an event that is aimed at um, having more girls or um, uh, gender non-conforming individuals in leadership roles and teams. And so um, even though the robots there tend to be the FTC, which is the first tech challenge or the um, FRC, the first robotics challenge, they, they tend to be the bigger robots built by high school students. Um, we invite and the, the individual teams, um, the individual high school teams will invite FLL teams or the, the girls on those FLL teams to come and experience what it means to be in roles of leadership on, um, on these big robotics teams. And that is an ORTOP event. That's not, there's no advancement associated with that, but without being registered, we have no way of getting in touch with you to let you know that it's happening. So you would have to register nationally, even though um, that's an ORTOP event, that's how we get contact information for teams. So in the fall, like I said, Girls Gen, First Fair, um, and then in the spring, because the season for FLL ends in March, usually, um, some I, in the last couple of years, it's been a little bit later because of the pandemic, but generally it ends in March. Um, we run an event in May that um, is non-competitive, but is another opportunity for teams to come be a community. Um, sometimes there are scrimmages, so they're not official competitions, but it's, a, it's another place where students can show off what they've been doing and what they've been learning. And, um, and it can help sustain a team throughout the off season. And again, the only way we know that your team exists is if, um, you've registered with FIRST, right? Because they send us the email addresses and they send us the contact information for teams. So season registration for teams means that you get invitations to all of those local events. You also get invitations to 
workshops and trainings, you get access to the ORTOP calendar, there's local support, so um, kind of trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of how to do this. We can usually help you out and um, help you find your team a mentor or, um, you know, whether that's a mentor team or an individual. And then you also get emails from ORTOP. And um, ORTOP is really working hard at keeping our communications um, relevant, frequent enough so that you are informed, but not so frequent that you are irritated. And it's a fine balance to walk, but we were working really hard at it. Um, so in order to come to events, you have to be registered with both FIRST and or top. Um, and that's a, it's a non-negotiable. We can't really, like, we can't get in touch with you if you're not um, registered with FIRST. And if you're not registered with WordTop, you can't come to our event. Um, so, and the composition of the team, right? Your team members, your coaches, if you have an administrator, all of that is set up through the FIRST dashboard. Um, so, Every team has to have two lead coaches and those lead coaches need to be able to pass YPP, the Youth Protection Program. And again, the, the things that you need to do for YPP are not particularly time consuming or arduous, but we're just making sure that all of our students are safe and there is an age uh, limit. You have to be over 18 to pass the background check. Um, so those coaches register online, they can send to the back, background check, which goes through a third party, um, but all of that is through the first dashboard and first just walks you through it. Um, and then you agree to the consent and release terms and all of it is online. For First Lego League, the maximum number of team members is 10. We recommend you don't go quite that high um, just because it gets hard for everybody to have the hands-on experience. So um, I, I usually think the sweet spot for a team is somewhere in the five to eight range, um, but you can have as many as 10. Every team member has to have that um, parent or guardian agreeing to a consent and release form. It is online, that is preferred. There are paper forms available if that's an issue. And then again, the, that administrator role, as someone in that role can register the team, they can invite the coaches onto the dashboard if someone's having trouble creating their own account, um, but they cannot actively manage individual team members because they don't, have to have YPP. Um, if the administrator is also a coach and they have YPP, then they get then they get kind of double access. But if all they're doing is administrating, they don't have they don't need YPP and they won't get access to individual team members' information. So the two coaches. Um, there's usually one that's a lead that's identified as a lead coach and one that's identified as the secondary coach. This has to do with making sure that there is an adult with the students at every time. Um, they are the organizers of the team. And it is really important to hear that they do not need to have content expertise, right? Um, so if you've never built a robot before, that's fine. Um, what you do need to be able to do as a lead coach is organize, right? So if you've ever organized a sports team or a birthday party or um, you know, a school field trip or any of that, those are the kinds of skills that you need to organize the team. You need to be able to figure out where your team is going to meet. You need to be able to figure out how you're gonna get the equipment there. You need to figure out snacks for the kids. Um, if you're going or coming, you know, if you're coming to a tournament, how are you getting there? Um, you know, who's driving and, and what are the, um, you know, who's in what car and, and keeping track of all of that. But that's actually, those are the, the absolutely necessary skills for leading a team. It's also really helpful if at least one of your coaches has, um, has a, a team spirit attitude, right? A, a kind of rah, rah, we can do this sort of team spirit. Um, and that, that just helps with team morale and, and kind of getting the momentum and the enthusiasm going. Um, if you, if you're feeling like there really are not 
any technical skills and you're feeling anxious about it, then you can also have a mentor in addition to a lead, in addition to your two coaches. Um, mentors are more technical. Um, they do not have to be over 18. So if you've got a local robotics team um, that is, you know, a high school robotics team, often those kids are really happy to mentor FLL teams. Um, they just can't be alone with, with that with the other team members, right? So um, a coach always has to be uh, present with the team and then you can bring in a mentor of any age and, um, and that's where you can get some of that technical help as your team finds that they need it. It is of course possible for the coach to be a mentor um, and play both roles. So you must have two over 18 year old adults who have passed YPP at all times with your team members. Um, and generally speaking, the person whose name goes under lead coach is the person that's going to get all of the correspondence. So um, if, you know, if you have a situation where you've got two people who are equally committed in terms of time and, you know, it, it's a co-coach situation, um, not so much a lead coach and a second coach, pick the person who doesn't mind getting their inbox flooded to be your lead coach. Um, so that lead coach, primary point of contact, um, and, and because they're the primary point of, point of contact, they're going to be the ones that that first and or top are assuming are navigating the bureaucracy. Um, so that's understanding kind of how to sign up, what to sign up for, what the calendar is going to be. Um, and again, it's that management and organizational skills piece. Um, it's not technical skills. So registering, recruiting, communicating, um, we need, you know, sometimes the emails that come through require responses, arranging for equipment and space, scheduling, um, and also really embracing and embodying core values. So the coaches, the mentors, um, all of the volunteers you'll see at an event, all of the judges, um, all also need to embody those core values um, from first and and the overarching core values are also gracious professionalism and what we call cooperation, which means that it's a competition, but we're also um, we're all made stronger by working together. So even though we're in competition, we're also collaborating and cooperating. So gracious professionalism and cooperation are absolutely essential character traits for our coaches um, and all of the adults that work with um, first teams. Again, if you bring in a mentor, um, uh, what we wanna see and what we really recommend is somebody who understands the pedagogy because they'll be inter interacting with your team members. Um, and so we wanna make sure that even, even though they may be the expert in the room, they are still there as a guide. They are th still there to support the team members learning and they are not there to um, kind of hand out answers. So they're valuing questions over answers. Um, looking toward structured problem solving and an engineering design process. Um, what they're facilitating is that robot design piece and programming skills. And they're helping, they're helping your students, they're helping your team members set achievable goals, right? That zone of proximal development, what can we actually get to um, with help and with scaffolding as opposed to um, you know, I had a third grader tell me he wanted to put rockets at the bottom of all of the houses in Louisiana so they couldn't get flooded again. And it's like, well, that's that's an engineering challenge, but it might not be one that we can get through in third grade. Um, so alumni can work as mentors as long as they don't actually do the work. And that's that can be alumni that are all the way out of the first ecosystem, right, in college or um, or it can be high school students. And um, um, and again, the mentor can be a coach as long as they meet the requirements for YPP. Um, so questions about roles before we dive into gameplay.
So I just have a question regarding uh, registration. If maybe you answered them, them, but I had to step out for a second. You mentioned we need to register, register the team with first and autops separately. Yes. So you you register with first to get the game piece and the, the game pieces and the challenge for this year, and you register with Ortop to indicate that you want to come to competitions. Okay, and I'm assuming there are links for registration on the Ortop website. There are. So you okay. you register nationally at firstinspires.org, and and that link is on Ortop's website, and you can register with Ortop right on Ortop's website. Excellent. Megan, uh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing, but I went okay. on Ortop's website just now and it links me to my dashboard on the first website. Is that, mm -hmm. am I in the right place? Yeah, that, that's where you can register with first because you okay. have to, you have to make the account, get your dashboard and then register your team. And so how do I tell from the dashboard if I'm registered for Ortop? The dashboard not, won't tell you if you're registered with Ortop um, because the, the first system, we get our data from first, they don't actually care about our data. So, so we, we get data from first, but there isn't a, a stream that goes back to first. Um, so you're not, you can't tell if you're registered with Ortop from your dashboard. What you can do is you can write registrar at ortop.org and ask. Okay. If I'm receiving the emails, would that be an indicator that I'm registered or um, I just need to double check? I, I would double check because it, it can be an indicator, but there's also, um, depend, it depends on the emails that you're receiving because there are emails that are sent to um, potential coaches or people that we are pretty sure are going to have a team this year, but maybe haven't. Um, gotten all the way signed up yet and we still send them emails so that they're they're you know that group of people is are not um, kind of behind once they once they get registered and so without knowing exactly which emails you're getting it's hard to say which list you're on okay okay so uh, for, uh, yeah. sorry for uh, making sure we are on the auto uh, list we should just send an email with to registrar at autop.com. Yeah, I mean it's you know you if you have a if you have a receipt or something that that's a, a guarantee that you're registered. But if you're not sure, registrar at ortop.org is is the way to go. And I'm gonna go ahead and pop that in the chat. Um, although I do think it's all over the website as well. But this is your go-to email for um, questions about your team because it'll it'll go to everybody on staff and then the right person will get back to you. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. So um, we're going to um, start talking about gameplay now. Um, so from year to year, the, the rules don't really change for gameplay, right? The, the kind of um, the basics of missions and what, what sorts of tasks the robot is going to be um, asked to do. So um, if you haven't yet gone on YouTube and, and seen a couple of games play, there's a, a, um, there's a mat that is in color on the mat are, are these things that we call mission models, which are um, little elements built out of regular Legos. Um, and then the robot is programmed to do various things one at a time. So it might be you know, to follow a line of a particular color and grab a ring from the mission model. It might be to um, put that ring into a different mission model that has a, a receptacle for it. Um, you know, there, there are sensors on the robots and one of the missions might be about getting those sensors to do a particular thing or stay a particular, you know, um, 
to stay a particular distance away from something or um, it's that sort of, those sorts of skills um, are the same from year to year. The thing that changes are the, are the field setup and the missions. So there's a theme every year. This year, it's um, it has to do with electricity and the you know the little individual mission models, the what the actual board looks like, um, and the um, kind of the the story behind all of the missions. That's going to change from year to year. So that is why it's so important for your team to get this year's challenge set because you can't actually run a team with last year's challenge set and then go to a competition because you won't have any of the right programs, you won't have any of the right missions. So the updates provide um, detailed interpretation and rule changes for each mission. And um, they get updated frequently throughout the season until Friday before the tournament weekend, right? So hints, tricks, Try this, try that. All of that is ongoing because it's a it's something that so many people are working on all at the same time. This is a challenge that that is um, being taken up by teams around the world. Um, so there are competitive events that um, are going to follow this an advancement path um, to first the Oregon Championship and then the first championships. So. Um, in Oregon, the way that we run it, and this just has to do with the number of teams that we have in Oregon and how our brackets work, um, the youngest group, um, which is First Lego League, well, it's not the absolute youngest, the absolute youngest is First Lego League Discover, and that's pre-K through first grade. Um, and those teams run events. Um, part of what we do is we help them run events in their classroom or in their um, group, so they're not being bussed around the state. But then second and third graders are in First Lego League Explore, and they go to something called a festival um, where they're not competing with each other, but they have a booth and they get to show what their robot can do and um, they get to talk to judges and um, it's run a lot more like a science fair than like a tournament. For First Lego League and for First Tech Challenge, which First Tech Challenge is seven through 12th grade, um, we run qualifying tournaments. So um, it's those are the ones that will start in December for First Lego League. And coming out of that qualifying tournament, then we'll go um, to Oregon Championships, which will be um, in that early, early spring. And then First Robotics Competition, which is another high school level. Um, they are ninth through 12th grade. Those teams can have up to 50 people. Uh, Chris is an alumni, I believe, of that program. Um, it's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, and those I'm are swiping at the cleaning lady. Right, <laughs> those are um, district events. So those are our Oregon and Washington teams compete together in, in one big district for that. And that's the Pacific Northwest District. Um, so specifically for FLL, um, the Qualifying tournaments are geographic, generally speaking. Um, and most, there are only a couple of teams that we get from outside of Oregon. Um, some of our Oregon teams out east in Malheur County go to Idaho, or some years the Idaho teams come to us. Um, in Southern Oregon, there are a couple of California teams that come up into Oregon because it, it just, the, the way the mountain ranges are, are arranged, it makes more sense for them to compete in Oregon. Um, and then there are a handful of teams on the border with Washington, particularly in the Tri-Cities uh, tri area that either go up or come down again, depending on, um, on what is geographically reasonable. But first Lego League, um, what you'll see is that qualifying tournament is you're, you're put in a qualifying tournament that makes the most sense for you geographically speaking. Um, and then from there, the Oregon Championship is one central location. So 
Additionally to those advancement events, right, the events that lead to worlds, um, including the festival, right, um, Expo Kids can, or Explore Kids can also go to the festival. Uh, no, too many, that's not right. Expo Kids coming out of the festival can also go to worlds. Um, we also run the uh, you know, non or less competitive events outside of the season, off season events that um, incorporate first rules, um, but they're, they're not connect connected to advancement. And that's where you see things like scrimmages, showcases, expos, workshops, girls' generation, um, first fair. You know, these are all community events, some of which may have competitive elements, but none of which are going to lead to advancement. Um, and some don't even have scoring involved, right? So kickoff happens at the beginning of every season. That's, that's a, a great party, but it has nothing to do with um, running robots. When we do outreach, when we do summer fairs, some of these are just ways where we are connecting with a larger community, where we invite um, people in to come and see robotics in Oregon, and there's no competitive element at all. So for FLL, again, um, that maximum team, team size is 10, but we really recommend that you stay under eight. Um, part of that just has to do with herding cats, right? With um, managing that many students, that, that um, many team members, all of whom wanna have a hands-on experience and having that, those dynamics. Um, but also part of it has to do with, you can only bring one robot to a tournament. And so it is possible to, and, and we actually recommend that if you have a larger team, if you have six kids on a team or seven kids on a team, that you have multiple robots for them to work with um, so that as they're learning the skills of programming and building, everybody has that hands-on opportunity. But at some point, it all has to narrow down into one robot that everybody's working on. And if you've got, you know, nine kids all working on one robot, that, that can be really challenging. So while it is possible to have a team of 10, if you have the resources, and that, that includes the kind of material, physical resources of the robot, but it also includes things like you know, more adults because you need, you need those two coaches per team, um, we recommend splitting into two teams. And you can still run the practices together and you can still do all of the skill building together, um, but that way everybody gets more of a chance to do hands-on. Um, and within a larger team, if you are running one, you can also have kind of a rotation of um, skill building. So, you know, a small group of two to three can can be experimenting with prototypes while someone else is learning programming to get techniques, while another group is working on innovation projects, and then you can rotate so everybody gets a chance. Um, one thing to know is that as excited as students are at the beginning, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, and they will lose interest somewhere in the middle, and that's where the team spirit rah-rah really comes in handy. Also, good snacks. Um, I cannot emphasize enough that having snacks and, and snacks that students like to eat will, will keep them interested um, while they're, they're kind of in the middle of it. And then their interest will spike again as we come closer to the tournaments. Um, so one of the organizational pieces that you're, you're gonna be really um, looking for is where can you meet? Um, so a field setup is a four by eight table. Um, you do need, you, so the mat that you'll get is soft, it's floppy, it needs to be on a hard surface. You can run it on the ground. Nothing bad happens if you put it on the ground, but there are particular elements, um, like particular missions or um, some scoring opportunities that have to do with the sides of the table or reaching over into another team's table. And so it is very helpful to at least have um, plywood on the bottom and sides even if it's not up on um, horses, right? 
You need space around the table and working space for everybody on your team. And you need some place to keep all of this stuff between meetings, particularly if you are working um, in a space in a school, whether you're a classroom teacher or um, an after school program or you're just using school space. Um, if you need a place to keep your things where it will not be disturbed between team meetings, because it is really frustrating. You know, some of these pieces don't, students will build the perfect what's it, right? And it doesn't look like anything to anyone who's not on the team. And so in between, they just look like Legos to everybody else and it gets taken apart. And then there are, you know, big tears and recriminations and all of that. So if you're working in any kind of shared space, having separate bins, locking area, whatever you can find to really say, don't, don't touch this during the season is really key. Um, and then um, I am, most of you are going to be on Spike Prime, which is the new brain for the robot. Um, those work well with tablets or computers. EV3s are the most recent um, past brains. Those also work on computers. As you get older, you get further and further away from being able to work on a tablet. Um, but, you know, if you're looking at some longer programming stints, having comfortable places for students to sit is also really useful. Um, and then of course, we're still in a global pandemic. So think about what your options might be um, if that comes into play again. So um, the, the robots that you can use for a competition are Spike Prime EV3 and NXT. The only, um, the only ones that are being supported by FIRST and by ORTOP are Spike Prime. Um, and it's about a five to seven year cycle for robots and Spike Prime is in its third year. So we just stopped offering the EV3 trainings. Um, you need computer and tablet compatible with uh, the robot set. And again, if you're using Spike Prime, it's an app. It's pretty much compatible with everything right now. The four by eight table with two by three side railings, there are instructions on how to build those yourself online, relatively easy if you have nails and a hammer and some sandpaper. Um, we found that if you just build the table and then you put it on two boxes, that works really well because then the boxes can get stored flat and you don't have to find a place to store sawhorses as well as, um, as well as the table. And also these boxes, interestingly, make the table at a slightly better height for um, team members that maybe haven't hit their growth spurt yet. Um, and the sawhorses are slightly more awkward. You also need your challenge set. And this is the thing that changes every year. If you're running multiple teams, you only need one challenge set because most you know, students will take their robot build and then come and test and then take their robot back and, and reiterate and program and then they'll come and test. So you really only need one table for multiple teams and then a way for teams to sort of check out the table to do their testing. Um, so if you end up in a, in a situation where you're running multiple teams, you don't need multiple challenge uh, sets. Usually one set for every three or four teams is probably enough. Uh, when you're talking about team formation, if you're looking at doing it inside a classroom, that's, um, I asked a question about class packs at the beginning. Um, class packs come with curriculum, assuming that you're going to be look, working with this for 45 minutes a day, five days a week. Um, that's not necessary to have a successful season, right? We see uh, much more frequently that it really looks more like an hour and a half twice a week, um, or even, you know, a couple of hours on a Saturday for neighborhood teams that are not associated with, with um, community programs. And what we've heard anecdotally is that um, successful teams spend somewhere between 40 and 50 hours before tournament season or before coming to their first tournament learning. Um, that being said, if you've got kids who already have, you know, a, a set of skills that are useful to robotics and programming, you don't necessarily need that many. So um, 
if you're a community organization or a club, you're looking at after school or evenings. If you're a family or a neighborhood team, again, after school evenings and weekends. And one question that we really want you to think about is, um, particularly if you are coming into this place of organizing or forming a team, not in the schools, which kind of have built in that equity of access, is how are you inviting and including students who otherwise might not have an opportunity to participate, right? What kind of outreach are you doing in your community? How are you inviting people in? We really, really want an inclusive robotics community in Oregon. And we really, really want an accessible robotics community in Oregon. So, you know, for those of you who are basing it kind of around your family's needs, which is wonderful, and we're so happy to have you, and I want to emphasize that, I also want to ask you to think about how do you get um, how do you get the word out to kids who are not necessarily in the friend group that your family is part of? Um, because the more that we can build our community in Oregon wider, the more students will have an opportunity for this program, the more students will have an opportunity for learning these skills and the better Oregon will be. Um, so this is not a drop-in program, right? It's not the kind of thing where a student can come and then not come for a couple of weeks and then show up and, you know, kind of come when there's not a soccer game or it, it really takes a commitment from the adults and from the, the kids involved. Um, and so that's, you know, that's where you get kind of that 40 to 50 hours of robust preparation um, and the consistency is what moves the project forward. So, so you need um, momentum and in order to get momentum, you need consistency of participation. So our recommendation is to hold a kickoff meeting with whatever families are involved. Um, you know, maybe recruit some, some local teenagers, get them to manage the students in a Lego activity that might be building the mission models because that it's like um, assembling Ikea furniture and the kids tend to have a lot of fun with it. Um, and then you can kind of separate off parents, guardians, mentor students, um, and set some expectations about about consistency, about how much time this is going to take, about who's going to bring the snacks and who's going to do the driving. Um, you can also, you know, how do you set a Q&A session, that kind of thing. Um, and so what you're here to, what you'll be asking your parents to do um, is review the core values, reminding them what PBL is, reminding them about participation and growth mindset. Um, your, for your team, it's also really important to emphasize core values, attendance, and the, the tournament as, as an end goal for the season, but not an end goal for the team, right? What we want is, is we want students to be leaving each tournament saying, this is what we're gonna do next time, or I really, I saw something I really wanna try, or, you know, the tournament is not the end, it's just the end of, you know, it's just the next, it's sort of a culminating event that is also a, um, a platform for the next culminating event. Um, sorry, my family just came home, so now the lights are on. Um, <laughs> You're also going to take that time to review costs and do a little fundraising. There are costs associated with this. Um, like I said, there's also team support available for teams that need it. Um, and ask for help, right? Ask for help from all of those families and people that are um, that are coming into um, coming into this ecosystem. So. The Lego Challenge Station, Jesse, do you mean the mission models? Yes, the mission models. So when you get the challenge set um, from first, it, it comes with booklets. And um, actually, they probably don't come with physical booklets anymore. And that's uh, how long I've been doing this. But they, they will come with instructions on how to build each of the mission models but they're not available to folks who have not purchased a challenge set. So 
So really quickly, here is approximately what your budget looks like. So you've got registration with FIRST. You've got, um, if you don't have a Spike Prime set uh, available to you, if you haven't, if you're, if you're starting a team from scratch and not restarting, um, you need your challenge set, which again can be shared. Um, so this is this 470 um, is per Spike Prime brain. So that might look more like, um, it might look like two or three, depending on how many kids you have and what your team is able to sustain. And then ORTOP registration for the season is an additional cost. Um, so if you're getting one robot um, and registering for everything else, it comes out to 1,092. And so on a team of eight, that's about $150. You also want to include in your own budget, snacks, transportation, and you know if there's any cost for location, that's gonna be something you wanna think about as well. And Oregon Championship registration um, is an additional fee. Again, there is team support available. So if you're looking at this number and thinking, I cannot run a team like this, you know, for this, there is team support available. Also, um, you would be surprised at the number of families that will that are not only happy to contribute for for themselves, but would be happy to contribute a little extra for somebody who maybe can't contribute at all. So um, don't let the number be intimidating. Ask us for help or for brainstorming ideas. Um, we won't have team support for every team. We we um, prioritize on a needs based um, on a needs basis. But we are a group of people with a lot of experience fundraising for teams, and so we can help you brainstorm how to do that in your community as well. If you don't qualify for for team support. Um, so the priority round has already, the first priority round has already closed, but um, it's a rolling application process. So um, the application is available online on the ORTOP website. And when you put it in, you're put into the pool that is, is usually about a mm, four to six week turnaround. Um, and the things that we ask for in return, um, we ask for an interim report, just letting us know, you know, did you use the money the way that you thought you would? How's it going? A final report, did you use the money the way you thought it, you thought you did? And then, um, depending on what grant your money comes from, sometimes there are some additional asks, right? So a sponsor might ask to. Um, see some photos of your team um, practice so that they can put on their website so that they can say, look, we're supporting this team, um, you know, or, or part of their advertising in the community. Um, sometimes they like thank you notes, sometimes they want their name on the back of your t-shirts. Um, and so all of that will be part of the conversation if you get a, um, a team support award from us that includes um, kind of requirements from you. There is, right now, there is quite a bit of money for um, teams that have girls in positions of leadership. And again, girls here means um, students who identify as female and also students who identify as gender nonconforming. And positions of leadership can, can look a lot of different ways. Um, it also can look like an all girls team and that money, um, Honestly, there's more money than we've been able to give away in the last couple of years, and we'd really like to, and Marie Landrum, which is where the money comes from, they would really like us to, too. So if you have a team that is girl heavy or um, has girls in key position of leadership, please let us know, um, because we have money for you. Okay. It is 828, um, so that is the end of the slides for tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to, um, to our faces and stop the recording. Um, and also we will um, take some questions and answers and then um, be ready for um, the rest of your evening, so. The recording is stopping.